morning, everybody. Thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us this morning uh, so that we can share some more information about our CLUE program, um, how we are supporting your students through virtual learning in this un these unprecedented times. So we are going to talk about how we're meeting the needs of our students and what this looks like in the virtual context. For our session norms, please make sure you are in a quiet area. We ask that you mute your microphone when you are not speaking. When you are speaking, if we address you and you have your hands up, please keep your points clear and concise. We wanna make sure that any questions that you have, that we answer them as clearly as possible. And try to use the chat feature to capture your questions. Uh, we will be going back and looking at these questions later. Uh, sometimes um, our parents, uh, we, we notice a trend in some of the questions you're asking, whether it's on our Facebook page or on Twitter or via email at clue at scsk12.org. And we will put together some FAQs and some answers to share out more broadly. So we welcome questions. We appreciate them. It helps us figure out what we need to address. Um, we also ask that you use the raise hand feature and follow the procedures that Ms. Forbes already covered. Before I jump into the agenda today, one of the things that I like to do when we meet with parents is make sure we are all understanding the words that we typically use when we talk about the, the CLUE program and gifted services so that we all know what we're talking about, right? So we have that normed understanding. So gifted in the state of Tennessee means that your child has been tested and has an IQ over 123 um, and has qualified for that gifted IEP. When a child isn't under the IEP and we serve them, they're talented, we provide enrichment for that child, but they're not technically gifted till they have the IEP. Gifted services are what the state of Tennessee requires us to provide for all the children who have been identified by the gifted IEP. And CLUE is the Shelby County Schools gifted program. And as you know, parents, we have students in our program who have the gifted IEP and we have students in our program who are locally identified for the need for enrichment. Um, we do have students who are twice exceptional. There are students often who are tested for other disabilities and when that testing requires a cognitive assessment and we find an IQ that meets the threshold required by the state, then we reach out to the parent and we start talking about giftedness. Giftedness manifests differently in different students and so there are times when we have twice exceptional students. Let me also share that we realize we have twice exceptional children who may only have the primary disability of giftedness and their exceptionality, um, their special learning need may be addressed in the medical information on the IEP for ADHD or for a medical condition. There are other ways um, that we identify some of our twice exceptional children and that's important because we want to serve every child appropriately. Equity, that word actually means equal access to good services, instruction, and care. Um, this is a big focus for our program right now. Um, and so we wanna make sure everybody understands that equity means equal access. The gifted IEP is the individualized education program that is written by a team at the school that is comprised of a, a local administrator at the school, the special education, uh, sorry, special education teacher, the regular education teacher and the parent that makes up the IEP team that drives the program that is outlined in the gifted IEP. Accommodations, the purpose of an accommodation is to provide a student with equal access to learning and an equal opportunity to show what he knows and what he can do. And we're gonna talk about accommodations later in the presentation. So here are the three big topics that we're going to talk about today. I want to make sure that the parents are aware of how we are serving students this fall um, using our virtual learning platform. Um, and we're also going to talk about the needs of our gifted students within this new learning context. And then I want to dive deeply into some appropriate accommodations for gifted students. So to be clear, our session today is an opportunity for us to share what we know with our parents, because when we join you on these IEP team meetings 
or when you're meeting with a teacher or when we partner with you in a phone call or an email trying to do what's best for, with, with your child, the more you know, the faster we can loop in all those supports to help you and your child. So this is very, um, very helpful, I think, for us and for you. So we're going to jump into the clue services. I just want to, we've talked about this uh, for a couple of uh, some forums, so I might go a little bit quickly through this, but I do want to make sure everybody understands what we're doing and why right now in the fall of 2020. So this is an overview of the CLUE program. We are in our 50th year serving gifted students in Shelby County Schools. We're very excited about that. We started the school year with almost 3,600 students, which is super exciting. We are in more elementary schools and middle and high schools than ever before serving kids. So we are excited about this year and all that it will bring. We are focused on providing equity of service to all CLU students. So that is bullet one for a reason. If we do nothing else, we are gonna be equitable. So it does not matter what school your child attends, they're gonna get the same services as all the other CLU students in that grade level, okay? The current pandemic limits that face-to-face, -face. and in years past, we have had to bus students from a school that had a very small population of CLU to another CLU center, and the reason is, is the, the benefit of having a CLU class is so that CLU students can interact with their intellectual peers, so we're taking them to where their intellectual peers are. So we can't do that in a pandemic, right? We can't cross contaminate buildings and teachers and students. So we would have been very limited um, with busing in this current pandemic. But luckily our solution is to use Microsoft Teams and we have created classes that are multi-grade and also multi-school location um, so that students interact with their peers. That is a huge advantage to them to be put into a group where they can connect with someone and can keep them motivated um, to excel and to you know keep going with their academics. So we're excited about that. We also realize that gifted services must be age appropriate and relevant. So we realize that we have to look at the overall needs of the child, the whole child, not just the academics. And how are we addressing that and providing what our kids need in this strange time? Those are at the forefront of our mind. We always have three types of programs for CLU. We have our enrichment pullout, which is does not require um, the gifted IEP. Studies are broad and interdisciplinary, as you've seen as parents. Uh, when students move into middle and high school, they take CLU as their English class. So they meet typically an hour a day. They are still using the um, CLU strategies to address critical and creative thinking. We usually have a novel of focus or you know, some sort of anchor text, but then we have related texts and different perspectives and different types of writing to come in to you know explore that topic more deeply because that's what gifted students need but middle and high school clue does require the IEP for students who have schools that attend um, that have only you know three or less clue students we typically provide what we call consultation. So we work with general ed teachers to make sure that everything is differentiated um, and rigorous and appropriate for the gifted child. But I will tell you, we, um, I think we only have about 30 students right now in consultation as we are working um, closely with schools and parents to try to find gifted classes for those students to join, um, just to leverage this wonderful opportunity to, again, provide equity of service. So if your child is on consultation and you get a phone call from me, that's what it's about. We're trying to see if you as the parent prefer consultation, that is what we are going to provide. If we need to meet with the team and we need to talk about how to get your child into a Clue English class, that's what we're going to do. So um, that's why we're excited about this opportunity to talk to you parents because you really are kind of the, the master of the ship helping us serve your child. The district released a virtual learning handbook manual document um, in the fall that talked very clearly about synchronous and asynchronous learning. And so what we have found in our research is that this absolutely supports gifted students and what they need. Our gifted kids do not want us babysitting them five hours a week on the computer. 
That is what the research says. The research says they actually do better in virtual learning if they are provided opportunities to build their self-efficacy. Meaning what we're trying to do is we set up a balance, a hybrid model of synchronous and asynchronous learning so that when we get to a clue strategy like this to that, where the child takes an object and they create a scene where you can't tell that that bell is a bell, it's turned into something else, but it goes with the topic. We can go off camera to do that so the child can go deeply into that creative process and deeply into creating that artwork. Then we come back on camera, let's say in 20 minutes, and everybody gets to show their work. The research shows that's the key moment when the students get feedback from their teacher and other students that actually has the biggest impact on their progress moving forward than any other part of the, pro of the process. So we are very mindful of that. Um, we do have our IEPs written as five hours per week because that 20 minutes when we're off camera and they're working on Clue stuff is still Clue services, right? So it's a hybrid model. Um, and again, this provides equity because everybody in the district is getting the same thing. We are still working on our differentiated curriculum. We use our visible thinking routines. We use our clue strategies. We are building that those creative and critical thinking skills because that is what A, empowers our students to grow and B, inspires them to keep going in all of their classes, not just clue. OK, so again, we have this this hybrid. The minimum is three hours. It depends on your teacher. It depends on the lesson. It depends on the unit. It depends on the week. It depends on do you have, you know, a guest speaker? Do you have a group project? So there's flexibility in this so that it makes sense, right? So that your students get what they need when they need it. Um, so this is just a sample of what could potentially happen. Um, and some teachers are doing this. So for example, this Wednesday class, if you know students need to take some time to finish up something from Monday, they could do that at the beginning. They could come together for the Microsoft Teams and then they can be released to do something else. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about accommodations. And one of the accommodations is differentiation of environment. So I know, for example, if my child's clue teacher assigns an art project, um, my child who's been sitting at a table all day on a Surface Pro would rather take a, um, a clipboard and their piece of paper and go sit on the couch and draw their this to that. Like our clue kids need some of that differentiation and more than just instruction. And that's what these schedules allow, okay? So in our middle and high school clue, we have a differentiated curriculum, and I think our parents know this. We have our anchor text. We have our related text. Um, our district has adopted a brand new English textbook, and there are some quality texts in that resource. Um, it, it just makes sense for us to leverage that because it was designed for an online platform. So everything that the children are asked to read and do in that textbook are provided online. They also have consumable workbooks that provide a copy of that text that they can annotate, highlight, make notes, and complete, which feels really good as a balance to the hybrid. So what we've done is we've taken our clue units and we've found other companion pieces in the Pearson textbook that can be brought into and augment what we're doing in Clue. Because really, Clue English is partly what are we going to focus on, but it's more about the how. How are we taking the textbook and creating performance-based objectives and finding ways for students to go above and beyond their grade level expectations? So we are kind, we're using both, right? So we've got our Clue curriculum and we've got Pearson and we're doing both because that's what's meeting the needs of our learners. Um, Clue English should have, your child should also have a hybrid model of instruction because there are times when students are going to need to be given the freedom to go off camera to read a chapter or to write a paper. Um, a best practice would be for the teacher to say, okay guys, go work on your essay, come back in 30 minutes and let me know how far you went, but I'm going to stay on camera. So if you have any questions, or if you need to ask me to help you write a transition or to help you fix this word, 
I'm going to be here to help you, right? So it's that blend of what do the kids need? And because we fall under the umbrella of special education for the state of Tennessee, we are allowed to meet the needs of the IEP by providing that flexibility. So a schedule for a middle and high school could potentially look like this. And again, this takes a lot of communication, right? So this just wouldn't happen naturally. The teacher would have to explain on Monday, I'm going to see you tomorrow on Teams. And on Tuesday, tomorrow, I need you to do A, B, and C. I'm going to post it in Teams at 8 o'clock. I'm going to check in at 830. We're going to go from there. Um, this flexibility is very helpful to our students. And I want to make sure parents are aware because of these unique circumstances, we are going to have all gifted IEP meetings through Microsoft Teams through the end of the school year. Um, even if students go back into the building, uh, the schools want to minimize exposure, of course, and so we don't need a bunch of adults in and out of the building throughout the school day. Um, and it's also a lot more efficient for teachers who are completing paperwork, for parents who are working full-time jobs, for us to just jump on for the IEP meeting. And then your clue teacher can walk you through how any paperwork would be completed in this environment. It's, it's actually not difficult. We have a streamlined approach. Um, but what I wanna make sure you're aware of as a parent is that as part of the IEP team, you are allowed and encouraged to request an IEP meeting whenever you feel the need. Um, that is something that we really value as a piece of support for our students, especially during this pandemic. We make all these plans and we have these great strategies and um, we have these you know, great devices that are at home. That plays out differently in everybody's living room right now, right? And so we want to help you help your child as best we can. So please don't ever apologize if you feel the need for an IEP meeting, if you feel the need to update your IEP team on your child's progress and what they need. All you need to do is reach out to the Clue teacher and request a meeting. We're happy to do it at any time. So before I jump into section two, um, are there any questions um, that we might need to address in the chat um, or any questions about services before we move forward? Several, Several parents, parents. Um, are asking when testing for clue services will resume. Got it. So we have um, very unique circumstances, as you can imagine. Um, we are still working to identify students. Um, we are in the process right now of completing all the testing from the students that we found last year, and it's really exciting for us. Um, I hope you saw in the newsletter we put a note that uh, even in a pandemic <laughs> with testing all the kids under limited, you know, opportunities and, and really strict constraints, um, we increased our program enrollment by 25% which has never been done. Um, and we are very excited about that and we want to continue growing. So um, what the state has advised us to do is to look at data trends. Um, there is probably no one assessment in this 2020-21 school year that is going to tell anybody, boom, that's a clue kid, right? What, what's going to alert us that there is a need is to look at trend data. So we saved all the data from last year, from the fall screener, from the winter screener. We're going to look at the fall screener. We're going to look at any other benchmarks that um, come out this year. We're going to look at student grades, um, but the universal screening process is separate from the other pathways where um, a, a child can be identified for clues. So if your child already has an IEP, it could be for speech, it could be for another disability, then your path to getting tested for clue is to request an IEP meeting and to go through the reevaluation process for cognitive assessment. Um, 
And if your child does not have achievement testing that qualifies under the state of Tennessee and your school psychologist can tell you that, you also need the academic achievement portion that comes with the school psychologist. If your child does not have a current IEP, um, you know, the, the best thing to do is to first reach out to your child's general education teacher and say, hey, this is what I'm observing. Um, I'd like to consider my child for Clue. And then, you know, that teacher can get you in touch with a Clue teacher and we can talk about the process. Um, right now, we have uh, third graders from last year. We were unable to test all of them um, before they were supposed to have the IEP for fourth grade. So we are testing them in fourth grade, uh, but we want to make sure parents know those fourth graders must have the IEP to continue to fifth grade. So if you're called and asked to test your child um, and you turn down the testing, please know that um, we're, we're gonna need to catch up at some point or your child is not gonna be allowed to continue to fifth grade. If your child is in third grade right now, um, we're hoping that uh, we can test them in the second semester because they will also need the IEP. Um, as of today, this information changes all the time, but as of today, they will need the IEP to go to fourth grade. So we have a lot of testing going on. Um, it is, um, there's a queue, you know, there's a funnel. We can't test every child at the same time. So um, there's a process, but we are happy to walk you through um, that process uh, if you need to. So I'm gonna keep going because we have a lot to cover this morning. So I wanna talk for just a second about gifted learners and virtual learning. Um, I've talked about this before. These slides have a lot of words on them. We're gonna make sure you have access to these slides, but what's important is we also have the research and the source on each slide. And what we want to do with this, this section is just to make sure you're aware that all the decisions we are making for programming are based in research. It's grounded in research. So while the situation we are in right now is very unique, there is research, albeit limited, there is research on gifted learners, virtual learning, and best practices for those conditions. And we are consulting that research as we make programming decisions. So for example, this piece of research talks about how gifted students benefit um, when the curriculum provides practice with complex topics, and you will see that at every grade level in our curriculum, critical thinking, self-reflection, that's our introspective piece, creativity, and then access to mentors. And so all of this can be established easily with technology. So again, this shows our kids are really teed up for their best learning environment actually um, in this uh, area. Um, one of the things that we have also seen in research, again, this goes back to the feedback that having um, that quick feedback within, whether it's a Microsoft form, whether it's a Nearpod, whether it's a, you know, we're gonna do a quick survey and show the results on the screen, all of that quick feedback loop that a, the technology provides for us um, helps their gifted students' attitudes towards educational programs more than any other method. So what we're trying to do right now is leverage that because when kids are excited about learning, it doesn't happen in that little microcosm of where the, you know, the inspiration happened. It's kind of like a pebble being thrown into water and it radiates out like a ripple and it actually affects their entire school experience, okay? Um, we also have seen that gifted students need to be in an environment that encourages the independence, motivation, and self-efficacy. Now this came, this was published by the National Association of Gifted Children, and this really backs up our hybrid approach. The idea that, you know, five hours requiring the kids to be on camera is not what's best for them. Okay, so we need to think through what is that hybrid approach gonna look like. There are some um, kind of, I hate to say warnings because that's a strange word, but there is some research that shows there could be some negative sides um, to using the technology. It says such as plagiarism, cyberbullying, viewing inappropriate contact, uh, content, technology addiction. I've heard parents talking about this, um, you know, for months now. 
Uh, the teachers are well versed in helping students with plagiarism. We have strategies to teach them how to avoid it, but also to um, how to course correct if it happens uh, by accident. Uh, Cyberbullying is, you know, that is something that's difficult for our gifted students who may not see their interaction that way because they need some social development um, and some interpersonal development. And so some of what we're trying to do right now with time in the classroom, um, working collaborative, collaboratively with students virtually should help that piece because it's going to teach them how to communicate appropriately in a virtual environment. Um, viewing and appropriate content, our district has been proactive about um, the filters and how um, they're keeping kids from going to certain areas. Technology addiction, I'm going back to, this is why we have a hybrid model. We need to remind our kids there are times when some of our activities still need to be done on pen and paper, still need to be done with markers and crayons, still need to be done, you know, through a conversation, not an app, right? So, all this research, what it says is as long as you're proactive about it, as long as the parents and the teachers take these precautions, we're going to be fine. So I want to make sure you're aware that we know this. We know you're aware of all of this and we're working proactively. Um, the other thing to note, and some of you may have been experiencing this um, with your own students, is that students, gifted students who feel isolated, who are introverts, who are not sociable, um, will feel even more isolated and will start to reject communication in this virtual world. Um, so there's there are policies out there, for example, I've worked with parents um, where our children uh, in the gifted program are not required to turn on their cameras because they want to feel safe. I mean, some of our students just freak out if you tell them to get on camera and we don't want that to happen, but we have to find ways to get them to engage um, and to kind of coach them on the purpose of the camera. And the idea is that we communicate mo with more than words and inflection. We communicate with facial expressions. We communicate with tone. We communicate with body language and being on camera and practicing those skills virtually is something they're going to need because I guarantee what we're going through right now is going to impact the careers that are available for them 20 years from now, right? So just be aware of this. What I've noticed with my own Clue students, my own children, is that the more they got used to the platforms, the more they got used to being on camera and, you know, um, talking in the chat, now they want to talk all the time on camera. Now they love the feedback they're getting from chatting and talking on the camera. And so that feedback piece, again, was inspirational to them to put themselves out there. And of course, that's how we all grow, but it's a process and we can help you with that. Um, and again, the basis for success of distance in, uh, education is noted by both competent teachers and successful students that it relies on both independent activities and information and communication technologies. We already know this. We need a variety. We can't just lecture and then have an exit ticket, right? We have to have some time for the students to lead for the time. You know, students can watch a video and then give their input. They can make presentations. They can be a part of presentations. They can publish, you know, a collaborative document and add to each other's ideas. It's that combination of switching things up every now and then that is going to be the basis for success. And I feel like we have that in the Clue program just by virtue of the fact that we are still using our Clue strategies, even in virtual learning. We are still addressing, you know, the um, different types of visual thinking and, you know, all of those best practices so that the lessons don't feel like they're a repeat every time the kids come to Clue. There's always we're always adding layers upon layers. So that is what's going to help our kids be successful, not only in Clue, but in other classes as well. So I'm going to take another pause and I'm going to check on the uh, questions that we have here. And I'm looking through. All right, so I don't see a bunch of questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep going and that will provide time at the end for anything specific 
Um, I know the last time we presented, some people were having trouble uh, with their chat and um, we needed to allow some other voices into the conversation and we're happy to do that. So uh, let me go ahead and get through this next piece that I think you'll find super helpful and then we'll take some questions, okay? So we're gonna talk for a second about accommodations. This is something that we are working as a, as a district to make sure that our uh, IEP team members are well versed in um, and I think it helps when parents are um, informed about this as well because that kind of um, I think improves the conversation about accommodations for gifted students in our IEP meetings. Okay so we know from the research that gifted learners learn differently from other students in three ways. One is the pace at which they learn. Two is the depth of their understanding. And three is the interests that they hold. I really don't have to tell you this, parents, because you already know this about your students, right? We, we know this, we don't need research. Okay, so gifted learners often learn more quickly and at a deeper level of understanding than other students in the classroom. But here's the key, it's they readily see the complexities. We can tell that by the questions they ask us, right? They ask really tough questions because they see those complexities and the connections to the real world. They make those connections more quickly than their age peers. However, the interests of the gifted learners are often intense and urgent, and they are often socially out of sync with their typical peers. This is what we know about gifted students. So that's why when we have a topic in Clue, it's not just things that live in the ocean something really broad. It's going to be sharks. It's going to be specific because they want to go so deeply into that content to look at those multiple layers that really excites them and inspires their brains, right? But their feelings are intense and they are urgent. Again, parents, I know I don't have to tell you that, but this research is backing us up. We're trying to make sure everybody has the same understanding. What we have found in research is that in a mixed ability classroom, it is the most able children that learn less new material. It's not the kids that are behind. Most curriculum is written for the children in the middle, right? And all of the scaffolding pieces that are built into curriculum that's published for a general classroom addresses the kids that are below the middle. The group that is often less left out are the kids that are most able because it's difficult to identify and provide alternatives to relearning what they already know. So Weinbrenner, uh -oh, I'm getting a notice about bad internet. Um, the weather's not helping us today, right? So Weinbrenner argues that a teacher's responsibility is not to teach the content, it's to teach the students, okay? So gifted students already know much of what we're planning to teach. Now I'm sharing this with you because this is one of the reasons why we can have an alternate curriculum in middle school and high school. This is one of the reasons that supports why we can pull students out of one math class, one English class every week in K-5. They already know what is going to be taught. What happens is not them coming back in and saying, I can't be, I can't handle Clue, I can't handle being pulled for Clue. It has nothing to do with them missing information they didn't know. I've been doing this a long time. What they can't handle is all of the work the teacher expects them to do when they come back. When they're pulled for two and a half hours for Clue, they're not supposed to do two and a half hours of work on top of everything else. The example I like to give because it's so concrete is if a child were pulled from my math class to go to Clue and they came back, I would give them an exit ticket for that lesson. If little Johnny makes an A on that exit ticket, it shows he didn't miss anything. If there are five questions and he misses number three, I can do a reteaching lesson in three minutes and get him back on track the next day. 
it should not be overwhelming for our kids to be pulled. And when it is, it's not new learning, it's the work. That is something that we can work on with you as a team in an IEP meeting. The reason that this is important is the longer that the clue student is allowed to believe that being smart means everything comes easy, the harder it is for them to rise to the challenge when they finally encounter one. So I'm gonna be really honest with you. We have a lot of clue students that start clue First, sec first grade, second grade, third grade, even seventh grade, and all of a sudden, they're asked to do something that they can't just do right, up, right automatically. They don't know how to handle it because the longer they go without that kind of challenge, the harder it is for them because they haven't built the strategies, right? They haven't had someone walk through a think aloud of how to process, what am I gonna do now? So that's why in CLUE, especially in K3, we try as early as possible to give them those challenges to A, show them everybody has challenges, right? Nobody knows everything. B, this is how we tackle it. We're gonna tackle it together. C, they're gonna overcome that challenge and they're gonna be 10 times better when they overcome that challenge, right? So this is what the research shows. And what we have to remember is when we're talking about accommodations, we have a ton of kids who are gifted. The state says actually 30% of gifted kids have another disability or special learning need that may or may not have been identified. Okay, but I'm gonna push it the other way. We have some students in different groups who are identified as having a different disability because no one has thought, hey, they might just be gifted because some of these characteristics manifest similarly, right? And if you're told a hammer is a hammer, why would you say it's something else? So there are four different types of accommodations when you think about how to, how to support any child with an IEP. We have variations in time, variation of input, variation of output, variation of size. This is according to the state of Tennessee. These are the four categories. The two that we use in CLUE for every child is pacing and compacting, variations in time, variation of size. What we're trying to do this year, we've created some courses and some professional development and some documents. We have to do a better job at making sure all teachers know what this means. Part of that parents is also educating our parents as to what this means because you're not gonna know if it's being done if you don't know what it is, and it needs to be done. When you have an IEP meeting and you write an IEP for your child, they are gifted all day long. They are not just gifted in CLUE, they are not just gifted in English. You should have pacing and compacting as an accommodation in every subject area. Now, I'm not saying it has to be in Spanish and PE and art and all that, like that, but the four core areas Math, science, social studies, ELA should have pacing and compacting. Let me tell you why. So pacing, we know that gifted students learn at a pace commensurate with their abilities because that maintains their interest and provides a developmentally appropriate level of challenge. But a lot of times people think pacing for gifted means that it has to be acceleration. That's not true. Remember, the gifted children want to go deep into that subject. Sometimes we have to push on our brakes and instead of going down that lesson plan, we have to follow the student down that rabbit hole because their deep interest in a topic is gonna to allow us to add layers of complexity that build their knowledge, probably more so than if we're trying to teach a lesson plan instead of teaching a student, right? So pacing is important, flexibility is key, and we have to respond to the need of the student. But again, sometimes with the, our gifted kids, it does mean acceleration and it does mean they really don't need to sit through all these lessons if they already know how to do it. They need to go learn something else. Um, please know too that these are allowable accommodations that any teacher can provide for any child when they see the need it's it's just a professional responsibility we just advocate for this because it's best practice for gifted compacting is something that going back to that example of the student who can't be pulled from clue because they can't make up the two and a half hours of work compacting is the accommodation that prevents that situation 
Compacting allows a technique for differentiating instruction that allows the teachers to make adjustments to the curriculum for students, okay? Replacing content students know with new content, enrichment options, or other activities. Researchers recommend that teachers first determine the goals of the unit, right? And determine the standards. So this isn't just a, you know, what do you feel like studying today? Well, let's go over here. That's not what we're talking about with compacting. What we're talking about is you really could go back to that old school idea that they did when I was in school many years ago, where they give the pretest that's very similar to the post test. And when you make an A on the pretest, you can do an individual study, or you can go deeper into the standard, or you can research an aspect of this topic and present it to your peers as part of your compacting and enrichment. But that's a benefit for your peers because now they're going to learn something that wasn't in our curriculum that deepens their understanding of the topic, right? So there's several different ways you can do this. Now we do pacing and compacting naturally in Clue, but what we're saying is when this is in the IEP, it should be done throughout the school day as needed. Here is a statistic. I, I wish I could take out a, a billboard. If I had all the money in the world and could take out some billboards, I would put this on a billboard. And if you want to write this down, this is a great one to write down. And I, I cited it at the bottom. OK, so elementary teachers can eliminate, meaning don't teach it, move on, scrap it all together. 24% to 70% of high ability students curriculum by compacting without any negative effect on test scores or performance. I'm giving a little wait time. I want that to sink in just a little bit. So we're not asking anybody to not do what's best for our students. The research shows they don't need to sit through that lesson. They need to move to the next piece, right? The hardest thing is that in really big class sizes, as a, I've been a gen ed teacher, it's hard to figure out who needs it and how to do it. And I want you to know this is one of the reasons why Clue English classes are capped at 15 students. Most of our Clue English classes have 12. They're not supposed to go above 15 because that is what allows us to differentiate instruction for your child. I'm going to be honest, we need your help advocating for this because it's not that way all across the district. The only way that we can compact and pace and do everything for each individual to figure out ways when they need to work individual or with a partner or with a group to create a different path of curriculum or when we're studying a novel and they finish it on day three because they just couldn't put it down, instead of penalizing them and saying, stay with us, we can give them the author's book two or something that shows a different perspective and have them start comparing and contrasting, going to the next level. We can't do that with 30 in a room, right? This is why I love the state of Tennessee. I started teaching in South Carolina and, and gifted is not in special education. They do not have IEPs over there. They don't have these protections. We have them in Tennessee and we need to use them as parents to support our students because curriculum compacting has a positive effect on student performance. In fact, when I get a phone call about a student who's failing, who is a CLUE student and I'm asked for advice or I'm asked to sit on an IEP meeting, the first question I ask is what compacting has been done for this student? Because this is crucial for many reasons. Our kids are perfectionists. Our kids are teacher pleasers. Our kids want to do the right thing. They only become underachievers when there are so many barriers in front of them and they can see five steps in front of the adults and they can see it's not gonna work out. And it's better for me to sit on my katukas and not do anything and be an underachiever than it is for me to get an F. That's what happens to our students. This approach 
prevents them from already learning material they already know, prevents the frustration, prevents the boredom, prevents the underachievement. And let me tell you, parents, if your child is underachieving in sixth grade, it's not going to change by magic by grade 11 when that transcript counts for, for college. We have to address underachievement as soon as we notice it so we can get the students back on track because our students are too smart. If they see there are too many walls in front of them and they can't break through them, they're going to give up. And yes, some of this I'm speaking from personal experience as a gifted child who is underachieving. OK, it's very difficult to get them back on track, but we're here to partner with you through that. There are some other accommodations that are appropriate for gifted learners. You do not have to have a doctor's note or another disability. Um, all you need is data. So for example, extended time. A best practice to discuss extended time if your child needs extended time would be to start trying to use that accommodation and have the data to show that it you that it works and then bring that to the IEP meeting. Acceleration, content modified rubric, pacing. I see that I'm running out of time. I could talk about this all day long. Um, where and when to engage. Please know all of these are an IEP team decision and you are part of that IEP team. I'm going to make sure you have the references that we have in our presentation um, in case you'd like to follow up and read any of the research by yourself. I'm also working on getting these references on clue901.com so that you can access them for free. And as always, if you have any questions for us, you're welcome to reach out to me at any time. My name is Jennifer Chandler. I am the supervisor of the CLUE program for Shelby County Schools, and I thank you sincerely for joining us today.